Broadcasting from the campus of Lynn Benton Community College, we are the Mid Valley STEM CTE Hub. I'm your host, Casey, and this, this is Closing the Gap. Welcome back, Closing the Gap fam. I'm very excited about our show today because we are headed out of the lab and into the field. I'm talking agriculture, one of my biggest STEAM interests, for those of you who are wondering. With Gabrielle McNally, the director of Women for the Land Initiative, part of the American Farmland Trust, which, if it's okay with you, I'll be calling AFT so I don't get tongue-tied. Well, Sounds great. <laughs> welcome, Gabrielle. Thank you for having me. So, um, you have this series of videos called Women of the Land, or I don't know if you produce it, but it's part of AFT, but that's mm-hmm. not all that you do over there. And I was wondering if you could give the listeners an overview of what AFT does and how Women for the Land ties into that. Yep, absolutely. So American Farmland Trust, or AFT, has been around for over 40 years now, and we really got started in the world of kind of farmland preservation. We arose really from the East Coast originally, kind of thinking about, you know, we can't do all the good things we want to do on farmland, including growing tasty food um, and supporting farmers if we don't protect that land. So we were one of the Mm -hmm. first organizations that started the kind of land trust movement for working lands. Mm -hmm. And then from that work, um, our organization has grown. So we continue to do land protection work. We're really famous for our farms under threat work, which is like tracking farmland loss across the country. There's some great stuff for what's happening in Oregon. Actually, Oregon is quite sad, despite some of our good policies around protecting rural and farmland, we have lost a significant amount of farmland in the last you know, decade plus. I won't tell you the exact number because I don't have it in front of me, uh, but I encourage folks to look at that. And then as as we, you know, we've evolved just to think from thinking about the preserving the land, we think a lot about what practices are on the land and how can we make a more sustainable agriculture. Of course, with climate change, we're thinking a lot about how do we make climate change, or sorry, how do we make climate change kind of part of agriculture, part of the way that we think about the practices we do that will help adapt to extremes, but also mitigate greenhouse gases. So that's increasingly a a place that we work in. And then the third thing that we kind of focus on is sort of like keeping people on the land, which can be a lot of different things. We have a farm viability initiative. We have the initiative that I run, which is Women for the Land, which is really focused on gender equity and thinking about how do we support women and increasingly non-binary folks um, in engaging with and having access to land, you know, financial, technical resources to support their success. And then at Women for the Land, we do kind of three things. We like our threes at AFT, but we also do a lot of programming. So we work with women, farmers, landowners, aspiring farmers, and get them access largely to what we call these like peer-to-peer learning networks, uh, which we call learning circles, where we bring folks together and share resources, connect them to one another. And then we found that folks take action as a result of participating in um, those events. And then we also do research. We just published a big gender equity report that kind of looks at the state of equity in gender equity in agriculture, not just sort of strictly on the gender binary, but we tried to look at kind of the what's going on for queer farmers, non-binary, as you might ex- um, understand, there's not a ton of data there, not even for us or necessarily women in ag as well. There's still a lot of data gaps, but from what we can see, Um, From the data, both in terms of the literature review and interviews we conducted, there's still a lot of barriers um, to reaching a more equitable agriculture. Agriculture continues to be one of the most unequal professions, particularly when it comes to income uh, for uh, sort of along gender lines. And then finally, um, we also focus on policy. So I'd say our programs and our research kind of support our understanding of what policy changes need to be made. And then we work both at the state and federal level to push forward policy. You know, and AFT works on this broader than just Women for the Land, but at Women for the Land, we're thinking about kind of how do we support more gender equity in agriculture. We passed a big Women in Ag resolution in California and are looking to do something even more expansive in New York in the coming years. Oh, that's cool. So you're 
work spans the entire country, not just our region. Correct. Yeah, we have an awesome and growing program in the Northwest, which we include Oregon, Washington, and Idaho when we talk about the Northwest. And we're dabbling in um, a little bit of work in Montana and Wyoming as well. But um, and then we're actually yeah growing in Oregon quite a bit at the moment. But we have programming in California, um, the Southeast, um, kind of the Eastern Seaboard, New York. We've got stuff happening in the Midwest, also kind of New England area and even now growing into places like Texas. So it's uh, ever expanding. <laughs> That's awesome. So what are some of the benefits of, you know, supporting local agriculture or growing your own garden, working in community gardens, stuff like that? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I think things like COVID-19 and the pandemic that we all experienced in one way or another um, really highlighted just how kind of insecure our food systems are because we have such a sort of globally aggregated um, food system. You know, we're relying on a lot of imports in the U.S., even though we produce a lot of food, right? It's mm -hmm. not like the food that's grown necessarily down the street from you is always something you can access. Some, you know, the, all the hazelnuts in Oregon, most of that is for export to other states or other countries. And so I think really thinking about local food and and both supporting local farmers who might be producing for any markets, but particularly the power and importance of supporting agriculture to support for local markets, particularly because we know things like COVID-19, things like big climate or weather disruptions have the ability to kind of disrupt our food systems. So the less connected we are, the less support we're providing for those systems, the more vulnerable we ultimately are. Plus, you know, it's a wonderful way to use the land um, for, you know, being in a place like Oregon where there's been a, a critique of expansion and kind of development keeping land and agriculture keeps that history, that land care and sort of use. Um, and so that it sort of enables folks to both have access to that as sort of consumers, but also for folks who want to be farmers and want to be involved in growing food and being connected to the land in that way. And it's a knowledge that increasingly we see people losing across the country, but also people want that knowledge. You know, there's a lot of young and beginning farmers who are, you know, diverse in their identities and want to be connected to the land in that way. So it's, it's exciting. So I think, yeah, for all those reasons, it's a great way to be connected to and feel more resilient. That's awesome. I like this kind of idea of like reciprocating support because um, especially during COVID-19, I was working at a, a local farm and they were doing like a VSA kind of program where um, people were going and dropping off boxes of vegetables, but also preserves and, you know, pasta sauce and like homemade pizzas that yeah. they could put in their freezer and stuff like that. And, um, yeah, just that, that support of like, oh, you're going to keep us afloat. We'll, we'll keep you fed. I think that's really interesting. Do you um, garden at all or raise livestock or anything like that in your free time? Yeah, I've always kind of been, I've worked in agriculture for, I guess, a couple decades now. Uh, <laughs> don't like to admit that. I keep getting older. But um, I have always been involved in agriculture one way or another. And I have never, I've worked on other people's kind of larger scale farms. I've never sort of had my own farm that is sort of like of scale. But I've, uh, the last, you know, the last many years have had a very large garden where I produce fruits and vegetables. We have quite a few chickens uh, at our place. We, I live in sort of the suburbs in Albany and, you know, we grow a lot. We have fruit trees and I do a lot of canning, preserving and cooking. So I've got you know, every year I'm putting up my jams and my tomato sauces and my chutneys and various other things I like to make. So um, yeah, and, and the garden's always kind of expanding. So I love that piece of things. And yeah, maybe one day could imagine having a slightly larger kind of production and have thought about kind of um, getting involved in kind of the value added uh, food stream where I sort of produce jams and jellies and tomatoes tomato sauces for like more than just my friends and family. Uh, but at the moment, I just do it for fun in that capacity. Cool. So how did you get um, interested in working in agriculture, specifically advocacy? Yeah, it's a I am a kind of an odd duck in that regard, because a lot of people I know working in this space, you know, came from agriculture, you know, their family owned land and they worked in this space. And I, you know, I always hearken it back to my grandmother um, who, you um, 
grew well grew up on the east coast my dad's mom uh she lived a lot of time in the city in new york but then later moved out to long island which historically had a lot of agriculture less so these days um and every time i would go visit her a number of times as a kid she would always have a huge garden and then we would always go out to local farms on long island and do you pick so and i loved it she always you know i think genuinely meant this that i was always the the best picker of the grandkids because i was really committed to like the production <laughs> you know the other kids would like pick for a little while and then get bored and i'd be like we're gonna pick all these strawberries all the raspberries and then we would put them up but um I think that just like early exposure gave me such a love of food and agriculture kind of being out in the with the with the land and with the folks who steward it and I loved you know as a lover of eating and and preparing food that sort of connection between like the garden to your dinner that night and so I think my grandma in particular fostered that love for me and then my parents were kind of hippies of the era and they really went back to the land for a time and got involved in the sort of natural food movement which included a lot of like local food and local ag and so I think those things inspired me and then you know when I was an undergrad in college up in Bellingham there was an outback farm there um, that I kind of started to engage as mm. a volunteer and so I think all of those things just sort of got like I love food I love eating I love the connection and community around growing food and it's a critical service to like live on planet earth and there's a lot of potential for sustainability but there's also kind of a lot of injustice and environmental degradation that happens through agriculture so it's like this fascinating thing that's both like really positive but can have some of these negative impacts so I was always kind of interested in understanding its complexity for sure for sure and I, I can imagine that different areas are probably facing different challenges when it comes to food production and climate change and everything and um, dealing with just like you know politics and whatnot Yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah, I think we're in an interesting time. I The good news in my mind is, you know, the U.S. Department of Agriculture has put a lot of money into addressing climate change. You know, people have their critiques. We could have a whole class about that. But but I think the, the good news is there's money coming in to help support things like climate smart agriculture or agriculture that's sort of designed to both kind of mitigate the worst impacts of climate change, but also be adaptive to these extremes that we're all experiencing, right? The crazy ice storms to, you know, sunny days, other parts of the country, you know, dealing with massive flooding, we're dealing with smoke and wildfire, like we're li living in this time of a lot more uncertainty around the weather and how it's changing quickly and sometimes quite disastrously. And so um, I'm really interested in kind of, yeah, just how different places are kind of building that resilience. But I think there's a lot of good news that there is, there is, there are resources that are kind of there to help folks kind of manage things differently. But I would definitely say, you know, despite the fact that there's a lot of regional differences, I, I think if I would like say what the biggest challenges are, you know, nationally, you know, farmland loss is huge, you know, and you see it here in Oregon, you see it other places, but that sort of preserving farmland for farming uses, I think is a big piece that dealing with extremes and the kind of variability and the uncertainty that that leads to. Um, and I think some of the sort of polarization around sort of even talking about climate change and climate resilience. Unfortunately, we live in this super polarized sort of political time in the U.S. And I've always felt like agriculture is a space where, you know, has been a traditionally more conservative space, but they're all there's a lot of folks who are interested in environmental benefits and food justice benefits. Like we're, there's all these different types of people who might want to sort of engage in that topic and I think there's a lot of common ground so I think you know despite the fact that the sort of challenge of that sort of tumult in our society but then there's a lot of folks who have shared interests and desires for like how can we manage and steward the land better how can we preserve it for the future how can we support people in being successful and staying on the land like I think that's a shared belief across a lot of different political kind of perspectives um, but I don't want to like, you know, Pollyanna, some of the challenges associated with all of that, but I do see some positive trends. <laughs> cool. You've mentioned stewardship, um, you know, preserving the land a couple times now. And, you know, when you look on the AFT website, you can see this, you can see the statistic um, that about 40% of the land in the next handful of years is going to be in transition. What does that mean? 
great question. And this is a, a really both kind of scary, but also exciting kind of topic that we're focusing a lot on at AFT right now. But we're thinking about, right, so that we have this aging demographic, the average age of farmers somewhere in the 60s. Uh, again, I don't have that statistic in front of me today. I should. Um, and we, um, we know that there's this sort of massive transition, but we've noted a lot of changes in across the country around sort of like who that next generation of farmer is the sort of traditional family kind of legacy where you know farmer retires and a child has historically often been a son who kind of takes over the farm that model is breaking apart it's not always working anymore people have left the farm so to speak it's not the son who wants to stay it's the daughter it's the cousin um, it's your neighbor who is an immigrant you know there's this sort of like diversifying group of people who want to get access to the land so we have this big you know sea change where you've got this aging demographic wanting to get out of agriculture or needing to get out of agriculture and this this next generation who wants to steward the land but doesn't always have a really easy pathway to accessing that land and being able to own it or lease it in a way that en enables them to have some kind of tenure and security so when we think about that we think we need to help support that group of folks who are transitioning to have a plan in place that helps them think through who's going to take over that land and also helping folks get creative about the fact that that might not be your your child, right? It might be someone who wants access to land who can't afford it. Are there models? And we've worked a lot on sort of preserving the land, um, not to get into all the details, but if you put sort of an agricultural easement on land, it can reduce sort of the market value for it um, enough so that it makes it a little bit more accessible for other folks to access it while folks are still able to sort of, you know, get some economic benefits from selling that land, but then it also preserves that land sort of in perpetuity, depending on the designs of the easement, so that that land is sort of required to stay in agriculture. Um, so having, we're doing a lot of sort of education and outreach. We have this big land transfer navigator program that's been launched that's really about helping folks who work in this space help people have the hard conversations associated with kind of land transfer because as you can imagine people who've maybe owned land for a long time or multi-generations and now can no longer steward it because of health or because the things have changed or because their kids don't want the land or don't want to farm the land you know it's an emotional thing you have to talk about their mortality their family dynamics um, but if we don't talk about and sort of address those things if it happens once someone has died or ha hit a health crisis, then that's oftentimes where land gets lost because you know, a developer can kind of come in and purchase the land and solve the problem, so to speak, for a family immediately, but kind of not solve the bigger problem. So we're trying to do that sort of early education and outreach to get people thinking earlier about the hard conversations and planning they need to do. And, it, you know, it's akin to like, you know, planning your will and, and your estate planning for someone who doesn't have a farm. It's just sometimes more complicated when you bring the land into it. Sure. Yeah. I just think it's I think it's interesting that the easements are a way that we're kind of going about getting more people back into farming that maybe aren't necessarily in like the lineage of the, the generations that have been taking care of that particular farm. Because like in late stage capitalism, you kind of think like, oh, you want to get your most the most bang for your buck possible. Um, but instead of like letting things go to condos, why is it important that the community is supporting local agriculture? Yeah. Well, and this is, you know, you you raise a really important issue because capitalism and our con the context that we are all living in, you know, increasing costs of life and land, ho housing, there's this tension people like want and often need financial sort of benefit of of those investments right but it's sometimes in tension with like there are other things that matter more than the financial bottom line there are things like you know preserving land so that it's it you know once you pave over farmland and put in condos it's unlikely to ever go back to right. you know farms um and of course that's not the only thing that's ever happening or even if that land is sort of like subdivided but you've got a lot of hobby farms and there's not a lot of production happening you you do have to ask that question of like well then what's happening with you know production of food locally state level like in general so there is this sort of like need to ensure that we're kind of thinking about that but also um 
getting people to sort of, yeah, I think both at a societal level, but at an individual level, you know, wondering like, what is the highest, best use and value that I have for this land? And do I always need the top dollar? You know, like, Mm -hmm. does that, you know, this comes up sometimes when people are just buying their own house, right? Like you could sell it to the person who can pay you the most in cash and be done. But maybe there's a younger family who is trying to get started and you can make it, you can sort of do business with them because you have a value to sort of support that next generation. So I think, you know, I hope as a society we're willing to have those conversations. I know I've had some really cool conversations with some landowners, especially women. But, of course, I work a lot with women who are like, you know, we have this land. It's an asset. It's worth money. But I don't just want it to be something that's held within my family, particularly if we're honest about how people, mostly white folks, have gotten land in this country. It was through colonization and genocide and enslavement. And then, you know, a lot of folks of color have lost lost land over, you know, folks in the and the West Coast and particularly during the Japanese internment in World War Two. Um, we've seen, you know, over the last hundred years, you know, I think it's 90% of black land loss has happened. And that's happened through a lot of kind of sketchy dealings and, and discrimination. And so, you know, I'm really impressed by some of the landowners, many of them, you know, white identifying who are saying like, you know, at least questioning like how, whose land is this? And can I put sort of some bit of what my investment and my family's value in to something that's like serving a broader social goal? So there are things like rematriation and reparations that, you know, that's like pretty radical. You know, I wouldn't say AFT as an organization is is delving super deep into that work, but I love raising it as like, these are options and, you know, helping people understand like, yeah, that we can, there are other values beyond the, the dollar that sort of can help us understand the good that something provides. And as a society, we should be willing to invest in that. And there are programs that can help people sort of incentivize those kinds of things to offset the costs associated with like, okay, you're not going to get quite as much money, but there are sort of, you know, thinking of, um, you know, um, like, you know, solar installation, you're like, you might have to put it in, but you're going to get a tax rebate. There are things like that for conservation practices. There are other benefits associated, like tax benefits associated with putting land in agricultural easement. So your tax burden reduces. So there are incentives we can put in place that help offset maybe the financial impact for making certain decisions. Sure. Yeah. It sounds kind of like an industry level of voting with your dollar Mm -hmm. or um, investing in your values. Mm -hmm. I I appreciate that for sure. And I feel like you're touching on a lot of things that really specifically hit home for Oregon too, when we talk about who has ownership of the land. Um, I think though, that there are some really great examples in our region of women who are, you know, having leadership or ownership of land. You know, we think about like maybe Sunbow or gathering together Mm -hmm. or, um, Lucky Crow or maybe even Mudbone for sure yeah. that um, you know you can see women at the helm of of these farms um, so where can where can women actually find community in this community and and find resources because um, you know I've, I've been talking to a lot of people a lot of women on the show and everyone is saying well most people are saying find a mentor find community and this is how you know you find eventual success so where can female farmers find this community and resources Absolutely. Well, um, I think there's a lot of good resources. Obviously, there are, you know, depending on sort of the scale you're thinking about, one um, organization locally that I am I am involved with, in addition to America Farmland Trust, is uh, Ten Rivers Food Web. Web. And um, we are sort of an uh, organization working at this sort of small county scale, um, Lynn and Benton county um thinking about how do we support and actually i should say we're growing sort of some of the other counties that we're engaging with uh but we are trying to build a new food directory and resources that are really connecting people at that hyper local level which is not just focused on women but it is a good example of kind of that local ag i think there's some good connections with the farmers market and ways that folks who are producing for the market in in those capacities can engage on the land trust side of things, um, Oregon Agricultural Trust, OAT, um, are doing some really important sort of education and outreach on local land trust needs. And of course, there are other even more hyper local land trusts. Um, again, not specifically for women. When we think about sort of like 
more gender focused resources. Oregon State University has a number of networks associated with women in the Willamette Valley as well as Southern Oregon. Uh, Tegan Moran right here in um, the, the sort of mid Willamette Valley is the lead for the network here. But depending on where you live, you can kind of look on their website and see which network you can connect to. And that's great. You know, people connect around field days, but sometimes it's like they're looking for equipment or resources to support each other. There are some sort of like um, shared learning um, activities. And then of course, with Women for the Land at farmland.org backslash women, you know, we do some regional programming right now in Oregon. We're mostly focused on the east side of the state, but we are expanding our network. So there are resources that people want to get involved. And then I'd also just mention the Farmer Veteran Coalition because we've been doing a lot of work with women veterans who are interested in agriculture and they have some great resources. And again, Tegan Moran's a good contact there or um, you could go to the Farmer Veteran Coalition's website and get some kind of regional information. They don't currently have an Oregon chapter. They have a Washington chapter, but there are folks in Oregon who are involved. But again, I think, I mean, my bigger sort of philo philosophical take is like looking at those different resources, finding your people, finding affinity groups. Um, I know the Oregon State and the Small Farms Program has done some work over the years kind of engaging with black farmers. Um, you speak of Mudbone and some other uh, folks who have been involved and sort of like uplifting, you know, BIPOC voices and making sure that there are groups that folks can find their connection and community. In Portland in particular, I'm more aware of some like, you know, queer farmer networks of support. There is sort of a national queer farmer network um, that I think is a little more Midwest based. There's Women Food and Ag Network, uh, more Midwest based as well, but you can still sometimes find resources. So I guess it's an all hands on deck kind of thing because the network and the connections we know through research and lived experience how important they are. And what network and community feels right for you is probably dependent on your identities and which ones you feel you need the most support and engagement with. And in terms of mentoring, um, I, I should also add that the Rogue, um, Rogue Farm Corps has some really good resources and they've done some mentoring, especially for new and aspiring farmers. And I think, um, you know, sometimes people are able to sort of work out impromptu mentoring opportunities, but I definitely know that those can be a little bit harder to be successful with, like when there's a container of support, both for mentors and mentees, like Rogue Farm Corps and others, but I think they're the probably the best, most obvious in, in the region. Um, like you just get more for your buck, but you also just get more kind of support, which everyone needs, because mentoring is is actually quite hard, you know, to learn how to be a good mentor. I think we used to think, you know, like just connect people, a new farmer and older farmer or more experienced farmer and like things will happen. But we recognize there's sort of a science and that's a lot of what we do too. Like we create these network activities, but they're really thoughtfully designed. Like we don't just throw people in, like we're very intentional about the space we create and how we develop it and it takes time. So that's all to say that like there are lots of resources and like, you know, it's not, there is a magic sauce that happens and it can look in different ways, but um, I think people do have to be intentional about it. Otherwise it doesn't always achieve the ends that you want it to. So hopefully that answers your question maybe more more than you wanted. I think it, I think it was a great answer to the question and it left me wanting to know more. <laughs> like what kinds of things would, do you think would make a good mentor and uh, mentee relationship in farming? Because some people, you know, they might be like, oh, I, you know, I like my neighbor farmer, but is that a good match? How would you know? Great question. And I know, actually, I'm pretty sure there are even some like worksheets that you can do. I think Rogue Farm Corps has put together. But my high level kind of reaction to that is, especially on the mentor, you know, I think that historically, one thing I've witnessed a lot with friends who really wanted to get in agriculture and, you know, took an internship at a farm. But there was often this sort of like, Ultimately, they were needed for their labor, which is important. Um, sometimes I feel like, you know, farmers like anyone else is looking for free or cheaper labor. But if that's the primary goal, you need someone to just like do tasks. That can be a slippery slope of like that doesn't always lead to the best like mentoring because you need time and you need intentionality. So I think for the mentor, like, do you you know want some support on your operation? But are you willing to put the time in to sort of teach and guide folks and not just sort of like the 
how to plant and how to do succession planning for, you know, for your, like your greenhouse, for instance, but also like how you're doing budget management and how you're thinking about the financial pieces. And, and you can also be intentional about like, Hey, I'm willing to mentor you because I'm really good at growing vegetables. I don't want to talk to you about like how to manage your books. You know, like I think you also be intentional about like what it is you're supporting someone in and what you're not. Um, and then I think for folks who want to find mentor mentors, yeah, doing that sort of like, you know, thinking it's not just about kind of that someone does something well, but like, are they generous of spirit? Do they have time? Are they in a financial place or at least is their business in a place that is kind of successful enough that they have maybe some capacity to provide support? Because I think sometimes a lot of farmers, you know, they're they're struggling to survive in a very difficult market place for agriculture. And you don't want to sort of add that burden to someone, even if their sort of heart is in the right place. So, um, you know, folks who are more experienced and in sort of like have been in I should say, the game longer can sometimes have a little bit more space to to provide that mentoring. But like anything, I like students who are like looking for a major professor or an advisor and you want to like, you know, interview people. You want to sort of see if it's a good fit and are your personalities aligned and are your values aligned, even if the sort of production is similar, because that's the stuff at the end of the day that like will get you like the poor communication and sort mm -hmm. of misplaced sort of roles and responsibilities even with the best intentions totally and i appreciate that you said communication because that's what i was hearing the whole time <laughs> you were talking was that um, you need to be really clear and intentional with your communication of what um, you're able to give what you're looking to receive and what you're willing and not willing to do and also something i got out of that was that you know one mentor not might not be enough you might need multiple mentors to get everything that you need to learn um, yeah. out of the out of the kind of mentor mentee relationship um and i i mean i think it's such a an awesome path to take but i was hoping that you could maybe kind of outline some reasons why you know getting into agriculture whether it's you know in the dirt or in advocacy why it's such a great career yeah well i definitely think that I've been in this field for a long time, so of course I think it is a great place to work. I think it's a great place, you know, whether you're in the field or, you know, more of sort of at that advocacy and programmatic space that I'm in more, um, you know, there is often this sort of like feeling very motivated by sort of your passion around land use, around sustainability, around environmental and social justice goals, like those sort of like the mission drive is as a big part of my inspiration. I know it is for the people I work with. Like they're not just, you know, no ding against folks who might be engineers or, you know, other, I'm going to pick on engineers today because I always do, but like, you know, sometimes there's a true passion for that, but it's like you fall into that. I feel like the people who end up in agriculture, there's like a big passion that's driving that. Like they're, they want to sort of build that work. I know you guys work with engineers, so no, no dig against engineers. But, no but, digs, <laughs> just an example. <laughs> um, but uh, I think just that, yeah, there's like a passion because it isn't as well compensated as other careers. Um, it's not terribly compensated in certain spaces, but you know, I think there has to be sort of this drive for the passion, what people want to accomplish. Um, but that said, because it's a growing, growing of it, I think there's a global and national appreciation for how valuable agriculture is and certainly there's been more money put into it from the USDA and other partners like I am now in a place where I've never seen before in in this industry where there's a lot of money coming in lots of different ways to support better careers and better sort of like living for the people who are working in it I think for farmers themselves I mean there's such a value to being stewards of the land and knowing the land well and treating it well and supporting for you know whether it's global or local markets like supporting the feeding of folks and um, the stewarding of animals and li like I think there's so much value and gratification that comes from that and I don't want to sort of dismiss the fact that it is hard work any of it but especially the folks who are you mentioned all these great farms Senbo and gathering together and totem farms another one of my favorite local ones but like folks are working really hard with small margins and that's true at the sort of local level it's even true for the big commodity producers like you know they're 
r the risk associated with the work because there's so many things out of your control and because societally we don't pay for food you know well there's a whole you could have a whole conversation about the cost of food um and it's great that it's lower and it's increasingly higher for a lot of folks these days um we want people to have affordable food and there's a cost associated with affordable food because we're often not paying farmers very much of that and they often get the smallest portion of a dollar. The National Farmers Union does a great piece about just how much of the dollar farmers receive of the, the sort of turkey you go get at the grocery store. And obviously that's another reason to shop local. More of your dollar goes back to that, those folks, but even at the local level, there are just a lot of costs. So. I'm trying to be promoting uh, working in agriculture and I want, but I just want to be real about like there are these financial challenges. Um, so I think people have to be driven by a passion and a drive to feed their communities, grow beautiful food and sort of be a part of a regional and national network of growers in this way that like is doing really good things for the planet. So I think, you know, and it's really for those of us who are stuck behind a computer a lot of the time, which is me, unfortunately, <laughs> um, there's like, I won't say nothing better than physical labor because I know that it is also hard, but there is something really lovely about being able to move and work your body. Uh, and, you know, there are challenges associated with that, but folks are able to um, be outside. Um, and that can be really nice. <laughs> oh, yeah, totally. Because I mean, I think you know, especially like vegetable or, or even flower farms, you know, really beautiful places to be yeah. most of the year because everything's in bloom and growing. Um, and it sounds like, you know, if, if a, you know, a potential farmer is really looking to aspire to have a large salary, maybe this might not be the way to go. And maybe like, you know, a victory garden at home would be maybe a more appropriate way to kind of get that interest fulfilled. Um, but like, are there any good social kinds of benefits for working for a farm? Like, um, are you, could you expect to get like, you know, good health insurance or, um, like retirement packages, things like that? Um, sadly, not necessarily. I think that is an area where there is some really cool policy work being done. Um, obviously for some larger scale you know, corporate, but still family kind of corporate farms, there are is a bit more of like an industry, there's a bit more of sort of a business sort of container and people do have access to 401ks and, and insurance, but the vast majority of farmers, even some of the larger scale, really struggle to access healthcare. So there's usually a, an off farm partner who is earning a job, um, who has access to healthcare. This has actually been a big policy issue with farm bills and just never really been resolved in terms of getting support for health care, getting support for child care. Uh, so some of those benefits are much harder to access in agriculture. Um, like I said, I think there's some work being done to address that, but that can be a really big tension. Um, but also, I mean, another way to look at it is acknowledging that folks sometimes are working in agriculture and also working other jobs. So I, I know a number of farmers who some of them work for American Farmland Trust who they have sort of a paid gig and get the 401k and they also still have a farm. Maybe they work fewer hours. Um, but I also want to be sort of thoughtful about like that that burden is a place where I think we can do better societally and we still need to do more work at the policy scale to ensure that folks working in these industries do have better access to health care and retirement plans oftentimes to the point about retirement the land is sort of this durable asset that people then can sell to sort of support their retirement but going back to the earlier conversation about farmland loss and development pressures that oftentimes that re reliance on the land being sort of the retirement um, nest egg can kind of fly in the face of other priorities around farmland preservation and stewardship so there's a lot of complexity there but I think I mean I love agriculture I've been involved in it for so long I think there's so many reasons to get more diverse passionate people involved in every element of it. There's also sort of marketing and value added. There are people who want to sort of produce 
you know, farm to table kind of restaurants or do more kind of canned goods and, and supporting local food industry. OSU and has some great programs around sort of like, you know, I know a colleague who's been researching food science, uh, ways to use whey byproduct of kind of cheese and milk production to make cool drinks that people can have. Like there's cool. people working in the sort of like food science world mm -hmm. that is also like tangentially connected. So I think there's a lot of ways to be connected to this industry without necessarily being a farmer. Um, but we also need awesome, passionate farmers um, out there doing this work. Totally. It, one of the benefits I do think is really great about generally like working in agriculture and working in, seasonally on farms is that um, it could be a really great stepping stone for someone who's maybe um, in transition in their career or trying to figure out what they maybe want to do ultimately because, um, you know, there's harvest times, there are planting times where all hands are on deck. So, you know, maybe this could be a really great, you know, career choice for someone who say they want to do they want to travel half the year and then you know half the year they get to um have a really stable good job where they can like you know make all of their money um and there are lots of different types of positions i mean there is stuff you can positions where you learn most of your skills like hands-on on the job and there's lots of jobs that you know you need a post-secondary education for could you maybe outline a few um on each side of the spectrum mm, yeah kind of different yeah different pathways well, they're definitely, I mean, you know, if you're at the sort of college scale, folks are interested in agronomy and horticulture kind of fields. Um, I think those can be really good foundational learning if you want to work in the industry, whether that's like, you know, I know folks who work at, for seed supply companies. There's a lot of seed supply companies. Obviously, there's a lot of grass seed, but there's a lot of like fruit and vegetable seed production in the Willamette Valley. And so having that sort of like botany, horticulture, agronomy, sort of foundational sort of undergraduate degree can be super valuable. And I've seen a lot of people kind of then take jobs in, you know, they might work for a company that sells fertilizers or pesticides or works kind of in that supply chain who needs to have a good sort of sense of production needs are folks who kind of go towards uh, like a natural resource conservation service or soil water conservation district that's kind of state and federal employment oftentimes I think having a master's is good again in those sort of like production so you can help people write conservation plans you can help people kind of get to their goals on the farm so giving people you know that really sort of tangible understanding of kind of like what is production agriculture you know there's for me, you know, my journey has been all the way through the piled higher and deeper with the PhD. I wanted to sort of understand the research and policy in a different level. I, that's often not necessary in this space, but if you are interested more in research and policy and kind of programmatic design at a sort of higher level, more systems level, you know, getting more, you know, masters and PhD can be a pathway for folks. Um, you know, my degree is in sociology and sustainable agriculture. So I kind of married my interest in social science with, um, I have quite a bit on the kind of understanding how cropping systems work. I know a bit about soil science. I'm not an expert in those things, but I know enough to kind of understand kind of the dynamic happening in the different context of farms that I work with that was really important. So I think there's a lot of different pathways that people can take. There is the farm business side. Um, there's the animal science side, a lot of resources regionally for that too. But um, I think, you know, at the bare minimum in terms of like degrees, having sort of um, having a sort of undergraduate degree in some of those fields can be really valuable. Um, but I also encourage people to like get real experience, like, you know, get out and work at a farm or, you know, the nursery industry is sort of tangential here, but it's also kind of connected to a lot of that work and have the experience of working in the field. And even if eventually you want to do something that's more of a desk jockey, as we like to call it, or someone who it might be is less field based, like having that experience of working on a farm is great and working on other people's farms i mean i also yeah not that we need to go down the sort of farm labor realm but there's you know there's a lot of complexity with like farm labor in in this state and others in terms of like there can be a really exploitative nature of that work and especially for folks who are undocumented or have immigrant status that doesn't you know give them as many rights uh, but for anybody working in that sort of physical labor there can be exploitation and violence that happens in those spaces um, that is really yeah a global you know and national and local 
issue we have. And so, you know, mm -hmm. I think folks have to kind of go wide open that there are some of those things and, and bad actors. I think there are a lot of producers who are doing their best by hiring labor and trying to pay people well and be respectful and have housing. But there are occasions where people are exploited and taken advantage of. Um, and that's a topic of a whole other podcast we could do. But I definitely think responsible for me to sort of just note that that is the reality out there um, for some folks. Yeah, for sure. Unfortunately, too, it, it happens in a lot of um, industries. And, you know, I think that with a lot of people, like vulnerable populations, you know, it just unfortunately seems almost unavoidable at some time. So, you know, I think going in as a as a young person, you know, you need to be an advocate for yourself and for those around you. Absolutely. Yeah, well said. So what kinds of um, people do really well in agriculture? Like what kinds of skills could you build to set yourself up for success? Mm. Well, um, I think, you know, again, it depends a little bit on what space, you know, I've heard some folks who are more, you know, production, like working in the field, folks who are good planners, good organizers, for folks who maybe like really want to farm, folks who like working on their own, working on their own schedule, who are like good at sort of managing themselves in creative kind of non-traditional, like someone who doesn't want the sit down nine to five kind of job. Um, some of our work with veterans, you know, um, folks have reflected like the veteran lifestyle, sort of um, this sort of like strong worth work ethic and kind of commitment to seeing a project all the way through and problem solving you know how to fix a tractor how to f fix a greenhouse you know like there can be um, a lot of fo folks who sort of like have that kind of analytical mind and who want a bit of space don't want to have you know it, it depends a bit if you're like the farm manager or if you're working for someone else's farm but oftentimes I'd say in ag, there's a little bit more autonomy, a little bit of ability to sort of work on your own. And so folks who like that, who want a little bit more of that, don't want to sit at the desk and kind of follow a, a you know, it's, it's a more creative workplace. So someone who's willing to kind of, to both be creative and problem solve, but also adaptable because um, every day is not going to be the same. You know, a lot, most farmers say like the thing they're thinking about all the time is weather and that could change. <laughs> like if the weather today, you know, we're like moving into the spring, it's sunny, it's been rainy. Um, so uh, my partner, you know, sp had to do some veggie uh, or some spraying of our tr fruit trees with some organic, you know, pesticides and this is the time so we had to drop everything else to spray trees we did it for some neighbors uh, because now the weather is not raining it's not windy we can do it now so I think in agriculture you got to kind of be like adaptable to like the weather's right for this or the weather's bad for this so what are you going to do it's been pouring for days and days and days maybe I'll do some inside work or clean some machines or whatever um, but then be ready to go so that kind of adaptability creative create Activity, problem solving. I think mean, there's a lot more opportunity for folks to have some initiative. Um, yeah, it's less kind of not quite sort of um, like A plus B equals C, right? There's a lot of different ways you can kind of engage in in agriculture in a way that might be less kind of strict than some other fields. For sure. Yeah, I kind of like the idea of like the self-starter freedom of, uh, of agriculture for sure. And you know, as we're winding down, it's I'm coming to this question that no one makes it out of here without me asking them. And that is, what advice do you have for the young farmers out there that are listening right now? Well, I, first of all, just really always like to acknowledge and sort of celebrate the farmers and farm workers and folks involved in the food supply chain. Like it is hard work and as we've noted, in, is not as well supported and resourced as some other fields and yet it's essential you know during COVID-19 it was like these essential workers but like we all do need to eat it's kind of a foundational part of being alive and um, having good local nourishing diverse food is such a such a gift and a privilege and so I always want to sort of really acknowledge like the hard work um, and then the advice I would have is you know I think continue to be creative in the things that you are doing. Um, you know, I know a local farmer here, I won't name names just to, to sort of go there, but they received a, an awesome grant to do um, 
some production for the food bank. The food bank gave them a big amount of a, a good chunk of money to sort of produce food for um, food insecure folks. And it provided sort of a foundational support for their farm, enabled them to sort of have a little more freedom. They're growing food that's sort of subsidized for low income folks. And um, I bring that example because um, I think that's a shows you like for new folks who want to get into this like you've got to be creative and look for cool opportunities to make your dreams happen and it can happen uh, but i also think like we still need policy level change and folks need to be you know not everybody wants to sort of engage in policy conversations but i do think if we want to create an agricultural system that's more sustainable more just and more like you know durable for for you know for the times that we have that we face in the future like folks need to be involved in 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 speaking you know i think congressional leaders at the federal and state level i mean they listen when farmers and producers show up to share their perspective you know a lot of times it's folks like me who you know i'm kind of an intermediary but i'm not the same and i think it's important it is labor and people should be compensated for that labor and you know, get your voice out there and be, and I don't even think that's around policy. Like the farmers who I see thriving are willing to do a little bit of like, they're on a board for a cool organization or they, they're they like engaged in their community in this way that's visible. And I think that helps people get resources to them. It is additional labor, which isn't always fair, but I think the reality is like if you can be out there and be visible, people are more able to kind of, opportunities will come your way. Uh, yeah, and just keep at it. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you for everything you've had to say today. I feel like this has been super um, informational, and I probably have like 50 follow-up questions for you <laughs> that could be a whole other show, but um, I appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Closing the Gap. If you like this show, subscribe on Spotify. You can also find us on Instagram at MVSTEMCTE, on Twitter at MidValleySTEM, and online at MidValleySTEM.org. Until next time, keep progressing.